Take your seats for what will be the final individual presentation of the afternoon, and that comes from Dr. Kate Mazur, the Board of Visitors Professor of History at Northwestern University. Specializing in the history of race, politics, and law in the 19th century United States, in 2022, Dr. Mazur was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in History and the winner of the John Now Book Prize from the University of Virginia for her work until justice be done. Dr. Mazur has consulted extensively with museums and arts organizations and has helped uh, develop numerous public history projects about the history of reconstruction. And as a very apposite last lecture of the day, Dr. Mazur's topic is reconstruction, when did it end? Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Kate Mazur. All right, thanks so much for having me, and thank you uh, to Rob and to Kelly and to the entire staff for making our visits so wonderful. And thank you to all of you for your kind attention today, and uh, I hope that you still have some energy and attention left for this last talk of the afternoon. Um, so let's see. So my talk today is Reconstruction, When Did It End? And uh, let me see, what, what is going to be my, here we go, okay. Um, so this may or may not be a surprising question for, for you. For many people, the answer to the question, Reconstruction, when did it end, is obviously 1877, uh, with a great political compromise. An electoral commission decided in the wake of the contested 1876 presidential election that Republican Rutherford Hayes had won the presidency, and then, according to the conventional narrative, Democrats extracted from Republicans a pledge to remove U.S. soldiers from three southern state capitals where they were stationed to help keep Republicans in office by force. The troops were removed. The Democrats quickly took charge of those state governments. That was in Florida, South Carolina, and Louisiana. And Repub uh, Reconstruction had thereby come to an end. And that is uh, sort of the conventional story. It's a very tidy story. It's very hard or very easy for us to understand too because it's tied to a major political event, a, a presidential election that was contested. And this was how it was resolved. But there are a lot of reasons to think that the year 1877 is not necessarily a very good turning point to imagine as the end of Reconstruction. And it's actually more useful for our understanding of this period and for teaching it, um, for many of us who teach uh, students, if we use a longer timeline, extending the period to the end of the 19th century. Now, I actually didn't give the question of when, reconstructed ended, when Reconstruction ended very much thought early on in my career, in part because I wrote my first book about a very particular place, Washington, D.C., during Reconstruction. And Reconstruction in Washington can readily be said to have ended in 1874, when Congress reorganized the Capitol's governments and disenfranchised almost all the voters. So for my first book, the year 1877 and the Compromise of 1877 were not necessarily a meaningful stopping point for the study. And so this question didn't necessarily, this larger question wasn't necessarily very important to me. And my experience with that book brings to mind another possible claim for ending when Reconstruction ended. Maybe the answer is, it depends on where you were. Some historians have argued that Reconstruction ended at different times in different places, and so it really depended where you were located geographically when, if you're using politics as a marker, when the Democrats regained power in local or state politics, making the end 
of a period, marking the end of a period of Republican control, or at the very least the end of a period of political vacillation between the two parties and the kind of assumption of the Democrats of kind of consistent political power. So maybe one argument for the, one answer to the question, when did Reconstruction end, is um, it ended, it depended where you were, and we can't really say uh, anything very consistent about it at all. Now there's another argument that I want to put forward, and that is that the, the Compromise of 1877 actually didn't happen. And that by pegging the end of Reconstruction to 1877, we're putting our faith or, uh, in a narrative that is largely not even true. Um, so it's worth noting that historians for decades, actually decades ago, unearthed evidence that there probably was actually no compromise of 1877 in the sense that most people understand it. There actually seems to have been no agreement, backroom deal between Republicans and Southern Democrats after the election commission made its decision that Democrats would allow Hayes to take office in, in exchange for Republicans removing what were supposedly the last troops from the former Confederate states. So it turns out that there's actually no direct evidence that such meetings ever occurred. And moreover, most of the supposed promises were not actually fulfilled. And indeed, also, Southern Democrats continued to object to Hayes taking office. And moreover, although Hayes did remove some of the troops from the Southern capitals, he didn't remove them all, and the issues of soldiers on the ground in the South continued to royal Congress during Hayes' presidency and beyond. So actually, by most contemporary accounts of this history, there wasn't actually a backroom deal compromise of 1877. Um, and yet, you know, that date as an ending for Reconstruction has really stuck. And I can speak from experience. I have a son right now who's taking AP U.S. History in uh, Evanston, Illinois. And uh, he, they'd studied Reconstruction. I said, when did it end? And he said, 1877. What could be more obvious? Um, so, uh, so I began to go beyond feeling like this was an academic question. And I began to feel like this was actually a very a more meaningful question. Um, when I was working on a study of reconstruction for the United States National Park Service, my co-author Greg Downs and I and several other historians who were involved in this project at the beginning um, talked about, we talked about what should be the chronological parameters of reconstruction as we conceived of it for this study, and we arrived at the years 1861 to 1900. Um, and we had discussed how a set of events in the 1890s um, really brought a period of experimentation to a more decisive conclusion than anything that, that happened in the 1870s. So when Downs and I wrote our study of reconstruction for the Park Service, we framed the period as one that lasted from the war years through about 1900. I became even more convinced that this is a helpful way of thinking about reconstruction in the course of a project I worked on over the last couple of years. This book has not been published yet, and I'm just gonna provide a sneak peek of it in my talk today. It's a graphic history of reconstruction in the Washington, D.C. region. And uh, region here is defined as Washington, D.C., and then several counties in Northern Virginia, several counties in Maryland, and one West Virginia county. Uh, this book was commissioned by the National Park Service, and it's illustrated by award-winning artist Liz Clark. This book, by the, like the National Park Service study, begins during the Civil War and more or less ends in the 1890s. And its title is Freedom Was in Sight, A Graphic History of Reconstruction in the Washington, D.C. Region. Working on the book um, and putting together a set of real historical actors, so this is telling the story of real individual people, um, institutions and storylines help me see um, even better just how much sense this chronology makes and how it has the potential to help us better understand and teach this complicated period. Seeing Reconstruction as an extended period that lasted into the 1890s, I'm going to argue today, helps us understand the period's significance differently. And I would argue that it helps us understand it better. It encourages us to see Reconstruction as the first phase of Americans' efforts to come to grips with the end of slavery. One, and a phase that ended not in total retrenchment, but in a new settlement of sorts. 
a settlement that was repressive for black Americans, to be sure, but also that allowed black Americans far more maneuvering room than they'd had during slavery. In this sense, the longer periodization helps us get out of a common challenge we face when talking about the period, for example, in our classrooms. Students often want to know why Reconstruction, this great experiment in American democracy, even mattered if by the time Reconstruction ended, according to the conventional periodization, the forces of racial subordination had triumphed once again. So if everything that Reconstruction stood for got erased in the end, what difference did it really make? We, we get asked that question by our students. We get asked that question um, in venues like this. Um, I thought a lot about that when I first learned about this period as a high school student myself. And there are a lot of different ways to answer the question, why did Reconstruction matter? But I do think if we envision this longer chronology, we can see not only the tragedies of Reconstruction, that, that white Southerners combined with the federal government's neglect, ultimately defeated the nation's first experiment with biracial democracy, but we can also see the lasting impacts of this period, particularly in the form of black community institutions that continue to develop despite racist terrorism and disenfranchisement. So this is a helpful, um, I would argue, way of understanding why this period after the Civil War really matters. So what is Reconstruction? What, what was it? Uh, when we use that word, what do we mean? Um, that is obviously a big question, and the answer to that question has changed a great deal over time as the historiography has developed. Uh, Reconstruction surely has something to do with the process of literally reconstructing the nation after the Civil War. Uh, it has to do with bringing the former Confederate states back into the Union and deciding what the terms of that reunion was going to be. Many people pay close attention to the machinations between President Andrew Johnson and Congress from about 1865 to 1868. So this really short period matters a lot. Um, and this is the period that's very familiar to a lot of people today. If you're anything like me or my kids going through high school, you study there's presidential reconstruction and then there's congressional or radical reconstruction. And that back and forth in a very brief period is often what gets drawn attention or gets attention uh, when it's taught. So yes, this period was certainly de defined by the process of bringing the former Confederate states back into the Union, but also very significantly with the nation coming to grips with the wartime abolition of slavery. This was a period of tremendous experimentation and open-ended possibility. About four million people who had been enslaved in the southern states became free. They formed families, they built churches, they constructed communities, not under the exact com conditions that they would have wanted, to be sure, but with much more latitude to make choices about how they lived and with whom than it had been possible in the past. Not incidentally, Americans also added three amendments to the Constitution and at the same time, at least for a time, used the power of the federal government to protect the rights of black Americans. Now, one other potential answer to when did Reconstruction end is that it never ended, right? Some of the changes that were set in motion by the Civil War and the end of slavery continue to flow outward into our own time. We could actually say that the United States is still grappling with the impact of race-based slavery that existed here for 200 years or more. But historians are in the business, I would say, of drawing smaller distinctions than that. So I don't think it's particularly helpful to say Reconstruction never ended. Um, so the question is, was there a moment when one period of adjustment meaningfully came to an end and another began? And the way that I'm going to talk about that today is to draw on this graphic history to tell one version of the story of Reconstruction, but to make the larger point that it makes sense to envision um, that an important period of experimentation that, that had to do with the abolition of slavery during the Civil War came to an end in the 1890s, not in 1877. So this book is about Washington. This, the graphic history that I'm drawing on is about the DC region, as I mentioned. Um, and so a lot of my examples are going to be drawn from there. And I'm going to be showing you today a mix of illustrations from the book and then actual images from the period. And you'll be able to tell the difference, I think. 
So I'm gonna start with the story of uh, the, the title of the book and the story of Nellie, a woman named Nellie Arnold Plummer, who came up with the phrase, freedom was in sight. This is a picture of Nellie Plummer. She, along with her twin brother, was born in 1860. Her parents were enslaved and living in Maryland, during, uh, near DC. Her older sister, Miranda, was sold away from the family in the fall of 1860. She was sold in the domestic slave trade to New Orleans. Later in life, Nellie wrote a book about the family that was self-published, and it was called Out of the Depths. And in this passage that I've quoted here, she described what she heard about her mother's escape from slavery during the war when she was just a toddler. And this passage gives the book its title. She wrote, no young woman of today can imagine the bravery that it took on mother's part to venture to Baltimore alone, as it were, through troops of soldiers during wartime with a girl of 14 years and a boy of 12, a girl nine years, and two babies to be carried. But love knows no fear. We still think she was a heroine. Indeed, freedom was in sight. And this powerful quote, this powerful story of a mother escaping slavery with her children, navigating among uh, U.S. troops to get to a space where she could be free to get away from her enslavers, um, is a great sort of, is a vignette that represents many thousands of people's experiences um, from the beginning to the end of the war of taking advantage of the moment of the battles, of the presence of U.S. soldiers um, to leave slavery and to try to begin to make a, a better life and freedom. Black residents of the free states also advanced the process of emancipation, many traveling south to work with freed people and become part of the larger cause of emancipation and the fight for dignity, equality, and autonomy. Harriet Jacobs was one of them. Harriet Jacobs escaped slavery in North Carolina in 1842. She moved first to Philadelphia and then she settled in New York, living there for quite a while where she worked on her memoir, which was later published as Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl in 1861. She went to Washington, D.C. in the summer of 1862. She was drawn there to work with freed people who were escaping from slavery. Many of them were coming into cities like Washington and Alexandria. And so from Washington, she moved to Alexandria and worked in Freedmen's Relief. And Jacobs saw an urgent need for schools among freed people. And so she established a school in Alexandria she had connections to women's organizations in the North, and so she left Alexandria for a while, going North to solicit donations, came back to Alexandria with her daughter, Louisa, who taught in the school, um, and that became a lasting school, which I'll show you in a minute. So this is an example of a frame, just one frame from the graphic history that from the very first page of the book that shows Jacobs on the train heading to Washington where she's going to do this work. And this gives you a flavor of the really beautiful color illustrations that Liz Clark made for this book. Jacobs, there was actually a photo taken of Harriet Jacobs School, um, and this is a picture of that school with a whole lot of students and Jacobs standing in front of it. So black soldiers enlisting in the United States Army starting in the winter of 1863. Their struggle for equal pay is well known, certainly if you've seen the film Glory, among other places, but uniformed black soldiers in the District of Columbia also demanded the right to ride as equals on the city streetcars. And among the leaders of that movement was George Hatton, who was born enslaved in Prince George's County, Maryland, and who quickly became a leader among enlisted black men. And you have, we don't have a photo of George Hatton. So in this case, uh, Liz Clark had to kind of just imagine what, he, what his face might have looked like. And here you have him refusing to ride on the outside of the streetcar in Washington, which we do know this happened because we have accounts of it in newspapers from the time. In Alexandria, black military laborers demanded the full pay of their wages, not had to not have a portion of their wages withheld for a fund for their families, so essentially to be treated the same as white workers were. Soldiers at Louverture Hospital in Alexandria insisted that black veterans should not have to be buried in segregated or separate burial grounds. Already during the war, black activists were also demanding the right to vote. In October of 1864, black American activists held a national convention in Syracuse, New York. Now in the free states before the Civil War, African Americans had enjoyed greater freedom of speech and assembly 
than in most slaveholding areas. And before the war, they had created a movement that demanded not just the abolition of slavery, but also racial equality in a variety of different spheres. And that is the subject of my book, Until Justice Be Done, and Manisha mentioned um, that earlier. So this Syracuse meeting in 1864 was special because black delegates from the southern states were able to travel more freely than ever before. And so, for example, the minutes of that meeting um, show that four men had traveled to Syracuse from Virginia to be part of that meeting. The Syracuse Convention issued a, what they called a Bill of Wrongs and Rights and an address to the American people. It described discrimination and abuses and demanded full citizenship for African Americans and racial equality in every regard, including in the right to vote. The people who gathered there in Syracuse in 1864 established an organization called the National Equal Rights League. And everyone who went there was supposed to return home to their communities and establish local equal rights leagues of their own. And many of them did so. So you can see that even before the war ended, black Americans were setting in motion a process not only of becoming free, but also of shaping their futures by building institutions and insisting on being treated with the same dignity and respect as white people expected. In the spring and summer of 1865, their mobilization continued. In Virginia, white communities were holding elections under Andrew Johnson's presidential reconstruction policy, and many elected former Confederates to serve in local office. Black Virginians, excluded from official politics, convened in a statewide convention in early August in Alexandria. The chair of that convention was one of those delegates who had been to Syracuse and come back, as had the minister who opened the proceedings with a prayer. These men and other black Virginians demanded equal rights and political recognition for African Americans in the state of Virginia. They did so under some duress, a delegate from near Williamsburg reported at the meeting that white neighbors had tried to prevent men from traveling to Alexandria to attend the meeting. And an Alexandria delegate read out loud a death threat directed at the entire convention. Yet the Alexandria Convention persevered in their purpose and among other things published an address to the American people. And this is a quote from that address. So you can see the kind of language that they used in the claims they were making. We claim then, as citizens of this state, the laws of the commonwealth shall give to all men equal protection, that each and every man may appeal to the law for his equal rights without regard to the color of his skin, and we believe this can only be done by extending to us the elective franchise, which we believe to be our inalienable right as free men, and which the Declaration of Independence guarantees to all free citizens of this government, and which the priv is the privilege of the nation. So obviously, when they say the elected franchise, they mean they are entitled to the right to vote. And this, again, is August 1865, long before Congress moved in the direction of enfranchising black men at the federal level. The black Americans who met in Alexandria were far from alone. And I, I know from my research that in New Bern, North Carolina, and Nashville, Tennessee, at the very least, People who had been at that Syracuse convention came back, formed equal rights leagues, participated in state conventions of African Americans. Across the South in 1865 and early 66, white political leaders excluded African Americans from the constitutional conventions meeting under Andrew Johnson's reconstruction policy, so black residents organized their own meetings, oftentimes at the same time and in the same town as the official meetings were taking place. They were organizing these parallel meetings. And they used those meetings to form uh, statements of political priorities. They published addresses in which they told white political leaders in their states and the, the federal government that they expected to be treated as full citizens, entitled to the same rights as white people. And they sought out newspaper coverage. They sent delegations to southern state houses and to Washington, DC. Essentially, they were engaged in every kind of politics you can imagine, despite the fact that the one thing they were not permitted to do at that point was vote or hold office. So at the same time as this political work is going on, African Americans were also working to build up communities in freedom. After the war, black Southerners sought out and often reunited with lost family members, pooled money to buy land on which to build churches, hired teachers, and formed mutual aid organizations. 
All the while, they tried to find decent work, mostly in agriculture, to save money, and in many cases, to purchase land of their own. And the graphic history we're able to represent, you know, some of these phenomena, and again, the illustrated form, I think, really lends itself to um, these kind of very everyday things that people did that were the, what constituted being free. So uh, the Plummer family sends the brother, Henry Plummer, to New Orleans to try to find Miranda, who had been sold away to, in slavery, and they reunite in New Orleans, and then Miranda comes back to uh, Prince George's County, Maryland, and she's very religious. She's very devout Baptist at that time and founds a black Baptist church in uh, Prince George's County. Um, and then on the right, you have more of a sort of uh, everyday family. They're not meant to represent anyone in particular, talking about how they're trying to save money and hope to buy land of their own one day. We were also able to represent some of the modest buildings, churches, schools, and lodge houses that black communities built, not in big cities like Washington and Alexandria. I mean, they did to some extent there too, but these characterized sort of rural hamlets where people were dispersed over the land, but then had small hamlets where there would be a church, a school, and oftentimes a lodge house. So switching gears and talking about what was going on in Washington, D.C., at the same time that all of these dynamics were happening in local communities and at the state level, Republicans in Congress were trying to set the United States on a new course as a nation. So as we've been talking about today, right, so the Republicans at this time are the party of Lincoln, the party that had overseen the Northern victory in the Civil War and the process of slavery's abolition. Under Republican leadership, Congress passed three constitutional amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which permanently abolished slavery, offered federal protections for civil rights, and barred racial discrimination in the right to vote. Black men began voting in the former Confederate states in 1867 after Congress passed a new statute requiring it. Um, and as we've seen, many black communities were already well prepared to participate in politics and had been demanding the right to vote already for some time by the time black men's enfranchisement happens in 1867. This new phase of federal policy led to a massive outpouring of political organizing union leagues, electioneering, voter registration. Um, now that black men could exercise the right to vote, in many places, African American men were elected to office and with a good deal of frequency. So the picture on the left is a very familiar picture of the African-American men who served in the United States House of Representatives and the Senate during Reconstruction. But the reality is more than 2,000 black men served in office, oftentimes or mostly in much more local offices, where actually their office holding made a great deal of difference in people's lives. They were things like sheriffs, tax collectors, served on the school board, served on the city council. Uh, in the book, we used a real person named Emma Brown, who was a school teacher in Washington, as our narrator. So when we come to times when we want to have someone just telling a little bit of history, we have a teacher, Emma Brown, standing in front of a blackboard often talking about, here she says, more than 2,000 black men held office during Reconstruction. So it's just sort of delivering that little fact. Um, one of the people who served in local office in Washington was George Hatton, who had protested racial discrimination on the D.C. streetcars in 1863. He was a USCT veteran. He comes back to Washington and is elected to the city council on a platform that is very friendly to policies that would create jobs for the many unemployed black laborers who were living in D.C. at the time. The graphic history offered really good opportunities for depicting women in history. And here, I, we sort of followed actual images like the ones I'm showing here, where you have on the left a, an image called electioneering in the South that shows a black man giving a speech to a small group of people on a plantation. Um, but you can see in the background that women are sitting there listening to the speech as well. And you know, other accounts reflect that African-American women were participating in politics, if not as voters, as people who were involved in community-level discussions of whom to elect and how to get involved. And likewise, in this uh, very well-known uh, depiction of the interior of First African Church in Richmond, you have black men and women. Of course, it's church, so it's, a, it's not a sex-segregated situation, but black churches were often sites where politics were discussed. Um, and so we're able to see that um, although the right to vote and hold office is something that's reserved for men, um, African-American women are very often involved in these processes. <laughs> 
So switching gears a little bit, so African Americans who demanded freedom and equality after slavery encountered quite a few white allies, but also staunch opposition from white people. Many white Southerners were reluctant to accept the end of slavery itself, much less black Americans' vision of full racial equality and the new vision of democracy that went along with it. White people tried to stymie their efforts in every way they could. They regularly set fire to black churches and schools in attempts to demoralize and threaten black communities. They tried to stop black men and their white Republican allies from voting. They resorted to threats, assaults, and even murder to roll back gains that black Americans had made. In the book, just as an aside, well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it in one second. So white-led violence against African Americans characterized the entire period beginning during the Civil War with reprisals against black soldiers who were fighting for the United States colored troops. Um, it did not, this violence of white people against black people did not begin with black men's right to vote in 1867, which people sometimes have said. Um, it began uh, early and it, it crossed the threshold of 1877, right? It didn't didn't start after 1877, it didn't stop after 1877. Um, in doing research for this book, I found that there were several lynchings in the region around Washington, D.C. in 1880, actually. Um, and so I chose to tell the story of the murder by a mob of a man named James Carroll in Frederick County, Maryland. And this is sort of, again, the aside I was going to mention, there's a lot of discussion about um, depicting racial violence and graphic imagery and sort of, and so in this case, and I could say more about this, but for the, the lynching that we discuss and depict in the graphic history, uh, we don't show a picture of a lynched body, but do show um, this picture. There's a, there's a whole context to this, but a picture of a noose and the faces of the white crowd looking up at it. And this was uh, the type of lynching where many members of the white community came out and, and saw it and sort of participated in it. Um, so the earlier promise of the Civil Rights Acts and the Constitutional Amendments of Reconstruction was that if local authorities did not prosecute people for crimes like this, which was often the case, that the federal government would step in, right? That was the fundamental promise, would be, there is a federal backstop if people cannot get justice in their states. But um, very often in this period, especially after the early 1870s, the US government either didn't have the force or did not have the will to stop white violence. Efforts to enforce federal law and protect the rights of black Americans were at their height in 1870 and 71 with the South Carolina Ku Klux Klan prosecutions. But the 1872 election and the economic crisis of 1873 made Republicans much less interested in enforcement because they believed it would cost them votes at home. Famously, in 1875, the Grant administration refused to step in when Mississippi Democrats resorted to terror and outright violence to suppress the black vote and ensure a Democratic victory in Mississippi. So the federal government's end to enforcement of civil rights policies began before 1877 and continued after it. So 1877 is not the dividing line about the government's waning interest in enforcing civil rights policies. At the same time, black activism and community building did not stop with 1877 and the removal of troops from these three southern capitals. Many of the dynamics unleashed by emancipation continued well into the 1880s and 1890s. In many places, black men continued to vote and hold office to be part of the Republican Party coalition. So the dynamics of experimentation that characterized the post-war years continued in ways that would be much more decisively halted in the 1890s. Black men were still getting elected to office in many places in the 1880s, and especially in Virginia. So for example, Richard Page in the Virginia State House uh, spoke out against lynching in Virginia in 1880. And we can see the broader power of the readjuster movement in Virginia from 1879 to 1883. In some places, the Knights of Labor were influential in the 1880s. And so you have the continuing kind of electoral power in some places of black voters and black elected officials, particularly in coalition with white Republicans. The question of public accommodations remained unsettled before and after 1877. African American women particularly took a prominent role in demanding the right to ride on streetcars and railroads. 
George Hatton had demanded the right to ride as an equal in Washington in 1863, but by the 1870s and his 80s, the most visible people sort of insisting on uh, equal rights to ride were women. Tennessee passed the first kind of explicitly uh, segregationist statute as far as public accommodations goes in 1875. Um, but black women, anyway, before and after that statute, continued to assert uh, the right to ride. Ida B. Wells is a prominent example, although there are many. Um, Wells, who's obviously better known for her anti-lynching activism, filed a lawsuit against a railroad company in Tennessee in 1884 for not allowing her to ride on the ladies' car, which was said to be reserved for white ladies only. She won her first case, but then it was appealed to the Tennessee State Supreme Court, and she lost there. Black women put their bodies and their dignities on the line. They wanted to be able to sit down and ride with dignity while traveling for work or for pleasure. My final example of kind of before and after 1877 has to do with education. Black women and men pushed emphatically for education for their children, knowing the value of it in part because during slavery, of course, most black Southerners had been denied access. In the post-war period, as the example of Harriet Jacobs showed, black people with their white allies mobilized to provide education for freed people at a variety of different levels. In fact, as many of you will probably know, during Reconstruction was the first time that southern states established their first public school systems, and these were committed to educating white and black students. Black legislators fought especially hard for public education. And the focus was on primary schools, like the sort of common school, lower level schools, but many also pushed for opportunities for high school education and college education. And so at this time is the founding of what are now known as HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. In the region that my book covers, um, Store College is another example. It was founded by white Northern free will Baptists during the war and became a black college that was particularly important for educating teachers who then taught school throughout the region. And another example was Jenny Dean's Manassas Industrial School. Um, Jenny Dean was born in slavery around 1848. She was from Manassas right near the battlefield. Um, she lived in Washington for a little while and then came back to her area of origin, uh, fundraised, went north to fundraise and came back and founded um, an industrial school that would give a technical education for eighth, people in eighth grade and above. Now one thing that I think is really interesting and this kind of gets us toward the end is Frederick Douglass was the keynote speaker at the opening of Jenny Dean's Industrial School, and this was in September, Labor Day, 1894. And his speech was, was a really remarkable document. It's a very long speech, and he comments also on the amazingness that so close to the Manassas battlefield, a school for black children, you know, where the, the armies representing slavery and freedom faced off against each other, is what he says. Um, you know, a school for black children is now opening up with the, with the sanction of local white authorities. Um, but the, one of the more poignant uh, things he said is he's talking to a bunch of young people, right? It's the students who are gonna be enrolling in the school. And he says, you young people have a right to ask what the future has in store for you and the people with whom you are classed. I've been watchman in your walls more than 50 years, so long that you think I ought to know what the future will bring to pass. You wanna know whether the hour is one of hope or despair. I have no time to answer this solemn inquiry at length or as it deserves. I will content myself with giving you the assurance of my belief. I think the situation is serious, but it is not hopeless. There is no time in our history that I would prefer to be present. The existence of the industrial school at Manassas is a triumphant rebuke to the cry of despair now heard in some quarters, nor does it stand alone. This moment in 1894, as I'm about to discuss, is a really pivotal moment. A lot of people are very worried about what is happening in the nation at this time. And Douglas is being asked to weigh in. Where, here is this older man you've seen so much. Where do you come down? And he actually says, we still need to have hope. I would not rather be alive at any other time. So what were the hallmarks of this dynamic period of reconstruction and the beginning of a new period? And what were the kinds of things that gave people a lot of pause in 1894? In the 1890s, before the 1890s, white Southerners were already 
regularly violating black men's right to vote. But in 1890 and 1891, when the Republicans once again controlled both houses of Congress and the presidency, they failed to pass new legislation to tighten protection of black men's right to vote. So in other words, they had the opportunity. Many people thought they were going to pass new legislation that would reinforce the right to vote, and they did not. In 1890, the state of Mississippi created a new constitution that placed extensive new restrictions on the right to vote with the intention of disenfranchising the black population. By the end of the decade, the Supreme Court had upheld segregation in public accommodations in Plessy versus Ferguson, bringing the widespread debate about segregated public accommodations essentially to an end. And the court upheld the Mississippi Constitution um, in the case of Williams versus Mississippi in 1898, basically saying what Mississippi is doing in terms of disenfranchisement does not violate the 15th Amendment. No one intervened from outside in Wilmington, North Carolina, when white residents staged a violent coup against an elected biracial coalition government. So what I think we have here is a more definitive national settlement of a variety of questions associated with the end of slavery. There would be no federal intervention when states and private parties violated black people's rights, even to the point of violently overthrowing an elected government. States were permitted to impose segregation. Abuses of laborers went almost entirely unchecked. With black men mostly disenfranchised in the southern states, their interests were no longer represented in politics. And so the conditions that emerged in the 1890s opened the door to the end of political competition in the South and then what we come to know in the 20th century as the solid democratic South that defined much of the 20th century. So I think we can rightly say that this marks a more decisive end to the period of adjustment to the end of slavery than anything that happened in the 1870s. I want to close by saying that it, uh, black mobilization during Reconstruction actually continued despite these large-scale political changes. So it is this period of dramatic retrenchment in the 1890s. Um, but I found in my research, for example, that uh, in architectural history and material culture history, that a new wave of black church and school buildings occurred in the 1880s and especially in the 1890s. And these buildings tend to be the ones that are still standing, not the earlier generation of post-Civil War buildings from the 60s and 70s, because these newer buildings from the 90s were designed by trained architects and built with more robust materials. So this is not the sign of people who are in retreat, who have no capacity to continue to build institutions. The historian Lauren Sweniger has shown that black property ownership steadily increased in the 1880s and 1890s in Maryland, DC, and Virginia as black Americans continued to save money and buy their own plots of land. And finally, institutions created during Reconstruction were a foundation for future activism. We end the book with the second meeting of the Niagara Movement, which was a black movement that drew together people from across different regions. And that second meeting convened at Storer College, again, this teaching institution that was founded during the Civil War. In a really important speech at that meeting at Storer College, Reverdy Ransom, a black pastor, um, invoked the history of struggle against race and racism. And he was talking about John Brown because they were, in part because they were at Harper's Ferry, which is the location of Storer College, and thinking about where they stood now in comparison to where they stood uh, in John Brown's time. And among the things he said was, the lines are clearly drawn, the supremacy of the Constitution has been challenged, and by that he's talking about things like Williams versus Mississippi and Plessy versus Ferguson. In fighting for his rights, the Negro defends the nation. His weapons are more powerful than pikes and sharps rifles with John Brown, which John Brown sought to place in his hands at Harper's Ferry. He has the Constitution, the courts, the ballot, the power to organize, to protest, and to resist. As they saw it at that moment, the situation they faced was dire, but in the wake of the long reconstruction, black Americans had new resources to call upon as they continued to insist that this country live up to its best ideals. Thank you. There's a question right here. And here, okay. Yeah. Well, I guess we need a mic. <laughs> 
It's clear that Reconstruction was a difficult period for black Southerners. But I've often heard the claim that Reconstruction was somehow oppressive for white Southerners. Mm -hmm. I, is there any validity to that at all? Um, yeah, so I was, I was, so there, times were very difficult for white Southerners after the Civil War, for many white Southerners. And um, what you're asking about, let me repeat the question. <laughs> um, so the question is, I've often heard that, like, okay, Reconstruction was difficult for black Southerners, but I've often heard that this was a very difficult period for white Southerners. Is that true at all? Um, you know, so first of all, let, let me say that, yes, the post-Civil War period was a very difficult period for many white Southerners. Why? Uh, well, a lot of the battles of the Civil War were fought in the South, so there was a lot of destruction um, of Southern property, of Southern agriculture. Uh, Slaves had been freed, so the white Southerners who owned slaves lost a lot of capital in the course of slave emancipation. Um, and they lost a war, so there was a lot of demoralization and, and a sense of real suffering as a result, right? So economic suffering, psychological suffering, um, and faced with a kind of world turned upside down in which the federal government was now saying, and black people were now saying, they were citizens, and they were entitled to the same rights as white people. But let me also add that, um, so there's that, there's the kind of uh, what I would say is like the true facts. Um, but then there's also the sort of mythology, and this goes to the kind of legendary historiography of Reconstruction, which is that for many generations, the way that the history of Reconstruction was told everywhere in this country was that this was a disastrous period in which the federal government inflicted vengeance upon the white south as punishment for secession. And so the misery of white southerners was because of unethical behavior by the federal government and that is the part of the story of white suffering is suffering at the hands of the vindictive north who just wouldn't let them alone until they asserted their right to govern themselves which of course equates to asserted the right to kind of reassert white supremacy. So some of that, so, so I feel like we need to kind of disaggregate, um, you know, the real suffering on a kind of humane level that a lot of people endured in the post, white Southerners endured after the Civil War with the also kind of uh, distorted perception that many of us have of this period as a result of um, generations of um, very, very politicized history writing. Dr. Mazur, thank you very much. Um, I came to the conference because of you. So um, two questions. Um, first is fast forward 20 years to the, uh, the period after the First World War and just the absolute uh, racial terrorism in the United States to understand the forces at play then, what had, what had changed so much in, in the country. And also, how would you characterize the states of the former Confederacy in the period um, at the end of Reconstruction until the Civil Rights Movement and Civil Rights Acts of the 1960s. Okay, so the first question is, why were things so, around the period of the First World War, why were things so violent? Like, why, why was there so much violence against African Americans? And then how would I characterize the former Confederate states from the end of Reconstruction to the Civil Rights Movement? <laughs> yeah, let's see, do you have like two hours? No, I, I mean, uh, let's see. I think there are a lot of different, obviously, there are a lot of different angles on these questions. You know, one, when we talk about World War I, and now I'm probably, you know, like, let me defer to all the World War I historians in the room, but um, there was a, there, in the, it, there are patterns around wars in American history and in any other country's history. And in our, the history of the United States, we've seen that the Civil War, World War I and World War II, um, all opened up discussions about, uh, or created conditions in which African Americans could open discussions about their citizenship, um, about it sort of expecting more from a country that expected them to serve their country. Um, by the way, also in every case, wars also opened up conversations about women's rights um, and kind of just conversations about like, okay, if all bets are off, if we're going through a period of emergency, if we're coming out of a, of a really weird kind of emergency period in, in history, then let's, th let's rethink a lot of things. Um, and so World War I, we see um, tremendous violence, you know, the red summer of 1919, tremendous outbreaks of violence by white people against black people, but also black assertions uh, that they are fully vested 
members of the society entitled to um, the same rights and the same dignity as white people in a context in which, you know, you're kind of in, a, in the height of Jim Crow, the height of the Jim Crow era. So that gets to the second question in a way. Um, you know, I, I would, one of the more significant ways of talking about this in a way that I talk about it and teaching in a kind of broad brushstroke sense is from the time that, that white Southerners kind of shut down black voting in most places in the 1890s until voting rights are opened back up in the 1960s, you know, there is, there's very unnatural Democratic Party dominance in the South. There's very little two-party competition. And so it just ends up meaning that it's a, you know, some people talk about it actually, especially in the, in the Deep South, as authoritarian enclaves um, in the sense that they are um, places where there, there's actually not a functioning democracy in any kind of real sense because not only are most of the many large percentages of the population that should be able to vote are not allowed to vote. And then that means that there's much less competition among parties because the whole range of political expression in politics is not possible. Um, and so that's part of the reason that, obviously, that voting rights are so important and that the 1965 Voting Rights Act is so important and the things that follow the enforcement of that law because it really, I mean, there are many ways to talk about it, but one of the ways to talk about it is it reopens the possibility of actually having a kind of political debate in the South that hadn't been possible in a lot of places. So in 1865, Four, Vice President Andrew Johnson declared to the enslaved people that he would be their Moses. I think many uh, historians today would say if that his actions as president were maybe the single biggest reason why Reconstruction broke down. I was wondering what your view would be of that perspective. Uh Sure. So Andrew Johnson the, uh, declared in 1864, coming from eastern Tennessee, right, Lincoln's vice president, that to, to African Americans, I will be your Moses. I will lead you to the promised land was the implication. Um, and then many historians think Johnson was responsible for reconstruction breaking down. Uh, what do I think of that? Um, I think that... <clears throat> Johnson, Johnson turned out to be a terrible president. Um, and one of the things that made him a terrible president was that he was politically very tone deaf. Um, and so what he didn't, he, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, people will compare Johnson's reconstruction policy from 18, early 1865 to Lincoln's that he announced at the end of 1863 and kind of say they're not that different. And Johnson kind of had it in for uh, wealthy, uh, Confederates more than Lincoln would have, um, but other than that, they're not that different. And so what happened? Or like, well, would Lincoln's, if Lincoln had lived, would his policy have been equally as disastrous as Johnson's turned out to be? Uh, but the situ but Johnson was politically tone deaf, and so first he pardoned all these former Confederates. He first disenfranchised them and said they couldn't serve in office, and then they all came knocking at his door, and he was like, of course you can have your voting rights back. Of course you can serve in office again. Um, and so that was probably a politically bad move on a lot of different levels. Um, it certainly angered Republicans in Congress, as did other aspects of Johnson's policies. And then in the winter of 1866, when Congress passed the Fr Second Freedmen's Bureau Bill and the Civil Rights Act of 1866, and Johnson vetoed them, uh, that was an incredibly bad decision because he got the Republicans in Congress to ally among themselves against him, right? You, he pushed people, there, there could have been people he could have made alliances with in Congress, and instead of kind of picking the people and trying to forge an alliance with them, he pushed them into alliance against him. Um, and so we were sort of joking at dinner, but you know, in some ways, uh, Johnson expedited the coming of um, black men's enfranchisement in the South, because at that point, by 1867, the Republicans were so unified against him, they had a veto-proof majority in Congress. Uh, so he so he absolutely didn't get what he wanted, and he actually sort of accidentally created the conditions in which he was disempowered as president. So um, one question from the live stream, just so that we can get one in. Uh, how was the how important was the lack of land ownership by freed slaves in the results of Reconstruction? So there are some surprising, how important was the, the lack of land ownership uh, in the results of Reconstruction? I mean, one of, the, one of the ways that people talk about Reconstruction is, 
if there had been widespread land redistribution as part of reconstruction policy, if land had been taken away from large landholders and distributed among what was essentially an agricultural working class, right? And so this sort of the idea of 40 acres and a mule, let's take these large land holdings and break them up and have freed people who have had their labor stolen from them for centuries uh, now have to be able to kind of come into ownership of their own labor and own a piece of land that things would have turned out extremely differently. Um, on the other hand, it never would have happened. Uh, it did not come close. Land redistribution, for better or for worse, did not come close to happening in the United States after the Civil War. Um, and so, you know, what African Americans who wanted to own land had to do was uh, save money and, uh, and fight back against a variety of kinds of discrimination. In some places, uh, white people really wouldn't sell to them. So, Lawrence Schweninger has written the best book on this, and it's called Black Property Owners in the South, like 1860, I forget, 5 to 1900. So in some places in Mississippi, in the Deep South, a lot of white people, even if they were really poor and would like to divest some of their land, they tended not to sell to African Americans because they just didn't want black people to own land. That wasn't as true in Virginia and uh, Maryland where uh, African Americans were more often able to come into land ownership, usually pretty small um, farms, um, but it was pretty typical for African Americans to actually buy land. So uh, it certainly wasn't made uh, easy, but there was, they did have in many places the capacity to go become small farmers farmers. Um, and one of the things that's nicely illustrated in this book is um, truck farming around D.C. because so people in the outlying areas have, you know, things like vegetable farms and stuff like that, and then they're able to um, sell those in Alexandria and Washington, just as an aside. Thank you, and I think that was the last question. That was the last question? Okay. I'll take a couple, I'll take one more question and then if you didn't get to ask your question, I'm happy to entertain it after. Uh, so uh, reconstruction, oftentimes summarized as an unfinished revolution. I'm just curious if you can kind of make an intervention there, maybe uh, come up with a better <laughs> short uh, description that we might use for reconstruction or do you think that's still the, the best way to think of it? I mean, that's the subtitle of uh, Eric Foner's 1988 book, right? Reconstruction America's Unre Unfinished Revolution, 1863 to 1877. <laughs> um, I love that title. I mean, you know, I think it invokes a lot of, uh, of things. I mean, first, uh, the idea that this was a, a revolutionary change in American life, something that was very dramatic, how it depends on how we want to define revolution, but uh, the idea that this was, this was an enormous transition. Um, and the idea that it's unfinished, you know, sort of my allusion to, you know, in some ways we could say, look, we're still grappling with the questions that were raised by centuries of race-based slavery in this country and its aftermath. Um, so I don't necessarily, I, I, I don't have a, a critique of that or a revision of it, but I guess I think that, and I hope maybe uh, you have found it potentially helpful to think about it in this longer chronology in the sense that, um, it helps us understand, I think, and it's helped me understand better, um, the, the longer arc of something really, of a, a period of expansive possibility coming to a close at a particular moment. Not that there was no possibility for any kind of you know, stuff going on by the 1890s, but just something, a variety of things happened in the 1890s that shut down a lot of the open-endedness that was possible. And that's not to say that nothing changed between the 1860s and the 1890s. Certainly things were looking grimmer and grimmer in some ways in the 1880s and early 90s. Um, but I, I guess I just, uh, I think in that way we're able to also talk about why it mattered a little bit better, that it, it's, not a, it's not a reversal, it's not an erasure of the things that were gained in Reconstruction, but kind of an unfolding and then a new settlement of a certain set of questions in the 1890s that you know were kind of settled temporarily, but never fully agreed upon. And certainly, you know, um, Black Americans continued to fight that settlement. Um, it didn't find it a satisfying place to end. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>